Gomes. Well, thank you very much for kind introduction and good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure and honor to be a moderator of this exciting session. And uh, also I'd like to say thank you very much first to uh, Horisan uh, arranging uh, this kind of uh, opportunity and all people who therefore made this uh, opportunity possible. Well, uh, today we are facing various kind of problems. And in Japan, new cabinet started and very fortunately, we could invite our minister in charge of the administrative reform and regulatory reform. This is the most uh, uh, attention-grabbing task of me uh, for the cabinet. And also, we are, have another special guest, Dr. Jane Harmon. He's the president of the Woodrow Wilson International uh, Center. And uh, maybe uh, two years ago, so we, she also appeared on this panel, and she mm -hmm. uh, made a great contribution to the discussion. So anyway, first of all, I'd like to invite uh, Minister Kono. As you know, he's the minister in charge of uh, regulatory reform, administrative reform, as I mentioned. Also, he used to be a minister of foreign affairs and a minister of defense. Uh, he can't speak anything about that. But, <laughs> But he should be very careful because this is the open session, okay? And also, first, I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Minister Kono. Uh, could you kindly make a presentation for 10, 15 minutes? Maybe you want to hear much uh, from him. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Minister Kono, please. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> Hi, Jane. Um, Hi, Manasan. When we were planning this conference, uh, I was defense minister, so I was ready to speak about the free and open Indo-Pacific and a threat coming from North Korea. But uh, there's a change of my portfolio. So here I am as a minister for regulatory reform and administrative reform and national civil service in Okinawa and the Northern Territories. Five years ago, I had a similar portfolio. And then I was focused on uh, making the lean government. So I called myself Minister for Administrative Reform. But this year, I think I would like to focus uh, regulatory reform to create a new uh, value for the society and the people. So call me Minister for Regulatory Reform. And, uh, well, what we are trying to do is, uh, well, I, I sort of set up an uh, email box to get ideas for regulatory reform from the people. And in several hours, I got uh, over 4,000 <laughs> emails. And it's definitely beyond my capacity, so I had to close down. And I told, uh, I told uh, people that I, I will go through every single email, so I'm still doing it <laughs> as of last night. But uh, uh, I was going through several hundred or maybe a couple, couple thousand. I noticed there are a lot of emails talking about his or her sufferings, uh, what kind of difficulty uh, they are facing. And uh, I realized we got to uh, do something about these issues. So my slogan for uh, our regulatory reform is uh, going to be kind to people, kind to the nature unkind to um, unfairness, injustice, and inconvenience. And we are trying to make the government, uh, government uh, services for uh, one stop and tailor-made. You should be able to do something uh, to do just the one thing and get things done or 
like during the COVID-19, people were suffering. And uh, so with my number and all the data, government should be in the future able to tell you what kind of government service you can uh, you are entitled to. So you don't have to go through all the government website and see, well, what could I get? Rather than that, I think the government should be able to tell you, you are entitled to these services. So that's what I'm trying to do. Well, uh, as a first step for the regulatory reform, um, we are trying to get rid of Hanko or uh, name stamp or personal seal or whatever. Um, I love using Hanko, so I'm putting my Hanko on the books that I have, or sometimes people asking my autograph, I put uh, two kinds of Hanko on that. Uh, I think that's a nice culture that uh, we need to keep. But uh, if you are trying to do the government procedures, uh, if you require to have Hanko on the paper, then this procedure won't be able to get online. So we need to get rid of Hanko through the government procedures. That's the first step. And we have counted the number of the government procedures that require Hanko on the paper physically. There are 11,000 of them. And out of 11,000, uh, only 820 government procedure accounted for more than 99% of the number of the government procedure actually uh, happening. So I asked all the government uh, ministries and agencies to look into those 820 government procedures. And they say only 35 of them uh, actually need a hanko on the paper. So other than those 35, uh, I think we're going to uh, abolish the procedures. But well, some require the change of the law so we need to go through uh, the parliament procedures next year. But uh, quite many of them don't really need that, so we should be able to do it. Out of 35, I think we can still uh, get away with eight or nine of them. Uh, we are still negotiating with the ministry. Well, that's just the first step. Then if you get rid of this Hanko procedure, then the next step would be uh, get rid of the paperwork or, you know, if you have to have a hanko on the paper, you need to print it out. And uh, so, you know, what you are doing online, you need to print out, put the hanko, and then send that in email or scan it and then attach to email and send it in. But if you don't have to put the hanko on the paper, you can do everything online and just submit it. And, or the government could uh, come up with some kind of online form and you just have to uh, fill them out. Uh, that'll be a lot easier. So that's what uh, I'm trying to do. I used to work for Fuji Xerox and I was actually involved in uh, development of uh, facsimiles. So, oh well, <laughs> things change. And also, there are some uh, requirement that you need to come to the government office to do something. And I think we need to get away with that too. So that'll be the second step. The third step, uh, we are trying to get rid of requirement for dedicated personnel or someone with license to be on the spot. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, any office with 1,000 employee has to have a, uh, what do you call it, industrial physician, a doctor to be there. Um, I spoke with the president of one major company and uh, he told me his headquarter, 80% of employee went online because of the COVID-19. So if you go to uh, headquarter of that company, it's kind of empty. There's only less than 20 people actually be there. 
but uh, according to the law, you still have to have this industrial physician on the spot. So he or she go to headquarters every day, but nobody's there. So he will talk to the people in need online. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> or in a power station or hydro dam, you have to have somebody with some kind of license to be there on the spot. And he's not able to do any other job than what he's required there. But most of the power station or hydro dam or those uh, things that require their licensed people on the spot are usually monitored by ICT technology from far away. So you don't really have to have somebody there or he doesn't have to do just that. He can do other things. So we are losing population and uh, employment rate, I mean, before COVID-19 was so low, we need to have efficient uh, management of the personnel. So we are trying to get rid of those uh, requirements for uh, dedicated personnel. The fourth step would be, uh, well, we can do these steps in parallel, uh, the third one and fourth one. Um, the fourth one is to make uh, government payment online. Uh, you have to pay tax, you have to pay health insurance premium, you have to sometimes have to pay traffic fines if you get caught in speeding. But like if you are trying to pay the fine, traffic fine, you have to go to the bank and pay it. Uh, so. If you're caught speeding, uh, you have to get a half day off to go to the bank to pay the fine, and that's not efficient. So we are trying to uh, make all the government paying can be done online or with a credit card or pay at a convenience store. So what we are trying to do is uh, all those things. And in order to, uh, like, if you change address, I just moved last year uh, simply right next door. But then I have to do all the things, you know, you, you have to change the driver license, you have to go to the banks, you have to do uh, with a telephone company, you have to change your address with, you know, all those things. If you can do all this with one stop, it will be a lot easier. Or if somebody in your family passed away, uh, you have to uh, do a lot of government procedures and then uh, you just have to find the bank account of those who are uh, deceased and then go to the bank and stop the account and all those things. And oftentimes you don't know which bank he, uh, he or she had her account. And sometimes, 105-year-old people passed away, and uh, her 80 years old uh, daughter has to do all the procedures, and uh, I mean, she's not gonna be able to do this. I mean, so she has to uh, go all the government agencies one by one, and it's kind of really tiresome. So if, you can, if we can do that with one procedures, it would be a lot easier. So what we are trying to do is to create a new uh, values for the society and to make the life more convenient. That's the goal of uh, our regulatory reform. And uh, well, because the prime minister uh, is making that very high up on the agenda, uh, all the other ministers in the cabinet are very uh, supportive of this. So we have a horizon. Uh, digital minister. Uh, Hirais and I invite uh, other minister one by one. We call it two plus one. And we are asking, okay, you need to do this. Uh, you, you need to do that. And they usually are very supportive of us. So we are trying to speed up the procedures. And that's what we are trying to do. I'm running out of time, so I will stop here. And uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Kun-san, for a very kind explanation on your plan. 
Uh, before inviting uh, Jane San, I'd like to wait some clarifying questions. Well, regulatory reform and uh, uh, administrative reform. Honestly speaking, we have a long history already. In the past decades, decades, many ministers have been working for that. There's still advancement, but uh, quite limited. What do you think is the biggest difference between the past and your effort? I really uh, appreciate if you explain that uh, you, what's new to the uh, Suga government. Um, yes, uh, I was doing this for five years ago, uh, too, and the major, major difference is the Prime Minister uh, keeps saying this is quite high up on his agenda. Sometimes he says this is a number one priority for the new government. So all the ministers, all the bureaucrats know that this is what the new Prime Minister wanted to do. Uh, so when, when we asked to get rid of Hanko, uh, we got the very prompt uh, reply from each uh, ministry. Mm -hmm. So I think whole government knows that this is the Prime Minister's priority and uh, it makes my job fairly easier than before. Well, thank you very much. Our test of Prime Minister's direction is very direct and clear, and also or maybe you have, as you mentioned, you have a very clear uh, strategic agenda uh, for the first time abolishing Hanshiko or something like that. We are very expecting a lot on that effort. Uh, one more question, Kono-san. Well, you are now in charge of the, uh, what I say, rearranging the policy board. Well, other government, I mean, a lot of things, but in that process, so many uh, policy boards were established or the Council on Economic Fiscal Policy, Council on Future Investment, the Council on such and such, such. the Regulatory Reform Council is already there. And Prime Minister Suga is very eager to rearrange this kind of right. Because Prime Minister is strongly against the vertically divided ministry system. Mm -hmm. At the same time, controlling tower, control, policy controlling tower itself is vertically divided. And in that process, the influence on many bureaucrats uh, being very strong, and uh, maybe you and Prime Minister are going to rearrange that. Uh, what, in what way are you going to change the Council on Regulatory Reform? Uh, it, this is a very uh, important topic now, people are watching. Well, the Council for Regulatory Reform is uh, a very important body, but uh, up to now, they usually come up with some kind of proposal in June for the cabinet approval. So there was a procedure, you start the new procedure in, you know, after the summer, and it goes on till June next year, and then come up with a proposal. And then the cabinet approve it, and then new procedures start. Um, it's a, it's, a good, it's a good way to do it, but uh, I, I think we wanted to speed up the process. So I, was, I, I told them that you don't have to worry about those annual schedule. You can just go after any regulation that need to be modified or that need to be got rid of. Uh, so you don't have to wait for next June for the you know, big proposal. You can do uh, things along the way. and. Uh, now we can meet uh, online. So already we have had four or five meetings of this council mm -hmm. already since I became the minister. So I think we can speed up the procedures and uh, we can tackle uh, more regulation than before, hopefully. Okay, thank you very, very much. Uh, later on, uh, the, you, the, the floor is open to your questions and comments. So, uh, thank you for waiting, uh, Jane San. Uh, I really appreciate you give uh, uh, some comments on uh, Minister Kono's uh, remarks. And also, if possible, I'd like you uh, to mention a little bit about the uh, U.S. Uh, China uh, fierce conflict or related uh, issues on uh, presidential election, etc., etc. Uh, I really appreciate your comment, Jane San. Thank you for waiting. Please. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning to many friends in Tokyo. It is evening in Washington. And especially uh, congratulations to my friend Yoshi on his 
10th uh, conference of G1 Global. I was there uh, two years ago, enjoyed it very much. I wish I was there now in person. Uh, it would be a great relief from being in crazy Washington. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I thought that what Kono-san had to say was extremely interesting, uh, especially the beginning. He said that uh, his slogan is, be kind to people and be unkind to injustice. Uh, some of you know that uh, the slogan of our president's reelection is, make America great again. Uh, MAGA, and many people wear a big red hat. Well, I saw this hat someplace, and I have been sending it to all my friends, and I don't know if you can read it. Can you read it? <laughs> it says, make America kind again. And I think this is a great hat because I think something that my country is missing right now is kindness. And too many people are yelling at too many other people and that is not a productive thing to do. And the United States Congress, where I served for nine terms, a very long time, uh, is not a place where people are kind to each other. It's not a place that gets much done. Uh, it's mostly about saying why the other guy is bad. It's not about working with somebody to solve big problems. And we have big problems, uh, like Japan, uh, we, and in fact, much worse than Japan, we have had a huge problem with uh, uh, COVID-19. And probably we're in the worst shape in the world, uh, uh, adjusted for our population. The, the death ratio to the total population by COVID-19, death ratio to the total population, is completely different between Asian countries and the United States. And in the case of the United States, this ratio is about 40 times of that of Japan. And in most European countries like France and Italy, England, this ratio is about 80 times of that of Japan. So while well, the discussion of COVID-19 uh, will be a little bit different, I think. In the case is, of is this working? Does it work? Oh, uh, you're coming back. Yay. Okay. Anyway. Welcome back, right. Jane san please continue. <laughs> Uh, modern technology is not so modern. I'm sorry. Anyway, I was just saying that uh, 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 I, uh, my country needs to be kind, and my country could use uh, Kono-san's uh, knowledge uh, to do a better job with the pandemic and to do a better job with our upcoming election. Um, that could be a big mess. Okay. Uh, uh in the United States, the uh, say, policy intellectual like Jane Sain is fighting against two things, fight against COVID-19 and fight against populism, maybe. Well, in that, compared with the United States or Japanese stations, basically better, I think. So, uh, kon -san, you mentioned uh, the name of the uh, digital minister, Hirai-san. And well, digital transformation is one of the most important tasks after COVID. 19, and in the process of uh, digital transformation, deregulation is necessary, right? For example, consider the case of remote education. But this kind of remote education is prohibited. There's a strong regulation, especially for the primary school students, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, as far as I know, Prime Minister Suga called you and Hirai-san to the Prime Minister's office. They, uh, right after the inauguration of him, so what kind of discussion are you uh, taking with uh, Mr. Hira, Minister Hirai? I, I heard you were supposed to have a, almost a weekly meeting, regulatory meeting, and uh, I really want to know what kind of discussion you are having together with the Minister Hirai. Well, in order for Hirai-san to put the government business online or make it now I've been told to turn the video off, so I, I'm sorry if, if I could, I don't know what to do, uh, but I was just saying that Kono-san is doing things in Japan that I wish somebody were doing in the United States, because we need better organization for fighting COVID and we need better organization for our election. And I'm hoping that uh, that will improve 
Uh, I'm happy to answer questions about the election, but uh, I, I would say uh, uh, basically that um, whoever wins our election, our relationship with Japan will be strong. And I can explain that. I don't think that uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden have the same uh, style. And I don't think they will have the same uh, team, but I think they understand, both of them, the importance, the strategic importance of Japan uh, to the United States. And um, uh, what is very interesting for me, having been in Japan over the years many, many times, is how, uh, how it has changed and how a conference like this uh, is, is uh, a much more informal and uh, creative uh, way to um, uh, discuss the future. And so again, uh, I just want to thank Yoshi for uh, being so creative and for um, the, the way he uh, uh, is interested in uh, the things that my center, the Wilson Center does, and the way he contributes to a conversation about uh, a, a, uh, uh, a, a new set of relationships in the world, not just the old relationships and not just the old way of doing things. So it's good to be on a panel with Kono-san and uh, obviously Ta Takanaka-san, and he was, he was there last time I was there, uh, to talk about uh, um, a, 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 better, a better approach to U.S.-Japan, a better approach to U.S.-China, which needs work, uh, and hopefully a kinder future, uh, both in my country and in your country. Thank you very much, uh, Jensen, for a very constructive comment on that. Uh, may I raise uh, one clarifying question, uh, Jensen? Japanese people, uh, honestly speaking, are uh, worrying about, uh, seriously, the fierce mm -hmm. conflict between the United States and China. And uh, mm -hmm. the other day, Larry Summers, Larry Summers, uh, former Secretary of Treasury, said in some conference, uh, who, whoever will be the President of the United States, this, fierce, uh, this conflict uh, between the United States and China will, will become much fierce, much more fierce. So under such circumstances, we are afraid of the decoupling of the world global market. Yeah. Well, uh, of course, the United States is the most important allied country. At the same time, China is the largest trade partner. About 20 to 25 percent of export and import of Japan is dependent on China. And uh, Jane san how do you see this uh, uh, conflict between the United States and China? Will this be, become more fierce or will be a little bit moderated in the future? Of course, this is a very difficult question. I really appreciate yeah. if you have some suggestions on that. <laughs> well, Larry, Larry Summers is a friend of mine, and he's a very smart man. Um, but Henry Kissinger is also a friend of mine, and he is a very smart man who had a major role in the opening up of the relationship between the, the major role, of the opening up of the relationship between the United States and, and China. And, at the Wilson Center, our China uh, program is called the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. China is first in the way we, we talk about it because we think the Kissinger Institute's role is to explain China to the United States. And I think part of the problem we are having is we don't understand, we in the United States don't understand China very well. Uh, we are now defining China, our official uh, uh, defense doctrine defines China as a strategic competitor. And I think that's what China is and should be, a strategic competitor. Um, there are things that China does uh, that uh, I would say, and I think most people in the United States would say, are wrong. China steals intellectual property. China violates human rights. On the other, on the other hand, China is uh, a, a, a not just a rising power, China is a risen power, like Japan is, and has a different strategy for, uh, a different philosophy for its government and a, a very highly developed strategy for its future. And 
where I hope we will go, we the U.S., and I hope China, I hope Japan too, is to treat China with respect as a competitor and to find ways where we can cooperate, and there are many ways we can, find ways where we compete and be not be afraid to criticize when we think something is wrong, like stealing intellectual property and abusing human rights. And uh, I think that that is possible. Certainly, I think it will be possible uh, in a Biden administration. Um, I think uh, he will build a, uh, uh, a national security team that understands China very well and that will uh, be tough, but also uh, uh, not do everything in public, have quiet conversations uh, with leaders in China to try to work on things. Uh, I hope that the U.S., for example, will rejoin the Paris Accord and work on uh, the environment with China and with the rest of the world. I hope the U.S. will rejoin uh, TPP or uh, some version of it, and I commend Japan for being the leader once the U.S. pulled out. I thought that was a mistake because um, for all the countries in, in Asia, China is your biggest trading partner. And the U.S. makes a mistake when it pulls away. If we were uh, in an organization with you, um, uh, it seems to me we would help you and help ourselves uh, compete with China. So uh, I, I would say that, that it, 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 there's not an easy path forward, but there is a clear way to do business and show respect for China as a strategic competitor. Well, thank you very much again, Jen-san, uh, for a very valuable comment. Now then, Kon-san, uh, the domestic reform is, of course, well, the most important task for uh, regarding the government. At the same time, I'd like to move a little bit to the global aspect of the, uh, uh, that. Japan's global role uh, in such a very uh, difficult situation, you are the most right person, the appropriate person to discuss that since you, you used to be the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister for Defense. I mm -hmm. really appreciate you who uh, give some comment on the global role of Japan under such circumstances. When I was uh, Defense Minister and when I spoke with uh, my counterpart in Europe or Asia, a lot of Defense Minister sort of worried about the world uh, divided after COVID-19, um, more precisely, on one hand, we're gonna have democracy uh, based on the rule of law, uh, human rights, and all those things. And then on the other hand, authoritarian regime. And on this side, uh, free society, and the other, other side is sort of a Orwellian society with a surveillance camera and the face recognition technology and all those things. On this side, uh, free flow of information through the internet. Uh, well, I mean, free flow it includes uh, fake news and all those things, but uh, you, can, you can do whatever you want on, online. This side, uh, the government would uh, so kind to uh, separate the right information and the wrong information and only the right information could go through internet. So the world may be divided into two uh, groups. And so we need to uh, work with US, Europe, Australia, Canada, other democratic like-minded country uh, to preserve uh, international uh, liberal international order uh, that made the uh, global economy so prosperous after the World War II. But when we talk about uh, democracy, uh, the European country and the United States could uh, tend to so, sort of shove it to the others. Good example is like uh, Myanmar. Uh, when I was a foreign minister, uh, when I went to G7 foreign ministers meeting, one uh, issue that Japan and Europe and Americans uh, disagreed was on Myanmar. 
they would like to force Myanmar government to accept uh, UN mission to go into the state of Rakhine to see so-called the Rohingya people issue. And uh, our position is, well, in Myanmar, the United Nations is considered to be always stand with Muslim people. So they are not a side of the Buddhist in Myanmar. And uh, if we force UN mission to the Aung San Suu Kyi government, if she accepts it, she may not have uh, support from the general public in, uh, or majority uh, from the uh, Myanmar people. If she refuses, then the global community would start criticizing Aung San Suu Kyi. I mean, her government start working towards democracy and still toddling. So we should uh, support her effort and we shouldn't really try to speed up the process. And that's when Boris Johnson was a British foreign minister and it was me and him. And we finally agree that we give time to Myanmar government. So our role in uh, global politics is, yes, we need to move towards democracy. It'll be uh, better if whole society, global society could move towards democracy uh, respect the human rights and the rule of law. But we need to take time. Some country could just go there, but some country need to take some time. And uh, as long as they are trying to move towards the goal, we, I think we should support their effort and not try to criticize them. So I think in our, our role in Japan in the global community is to bridge uh, Christian value of Europe and United States and other country and uh, other culture and let's move towards that way but everyone, every state has different speed and I think that's what we need to do in the global politics. Well, thank you very much, Kono san. You raised a very interesting case. Well, well Japan has been uh, you know, enjoying the so-called liberal world order in, in the, uh, after the Second World War. A liberal world order means uh, free trade and uh, rule of the law and uh, also globalization, multilateralism, etc., etc. So you, we have to uh, continue to take this kind of law for the stability and development of the global community. Jane-san, okay, uh, the global role, uh, Japan's global role, uh, do you, could you kindly read some comment on this, what do you expect in Japan in this respect? Okay. Well, I realize I did not a answer part of your question before about China. I think it would be a huge mistake to divide the world economy into two parts. And uh, I think there are ways, again, consistent with uh, uh, strategic competition, uh, to have one world economy and have uh, uh, a protect ourselves in national security terms from, from intrusions of a government uh, using, using some of its back doors, but on the other hand, uh, be able to work together so we build a, a kind of globalization that is more inclusive. I think one of the problems that we've had is that globalization and technology leave out a lot of people, and we have not figured out how to design work for people for the future. And uh, I think that relates to your question. Japan is a very advanced society. It is the world's third largest economy. It is having, uh, uh, in, in, a, in a major recession, just like the United States, uh, partly caused by COVID and uh, basically negative in interest rates. Uh, but I think it has uh, very good leadership and a very talented population. So what do I see for Japan in the future? I see Japan as a partner of the United States, uh, and I see Japan as a competitor, but, but, but a country that can work with China uh, to make sure that we do have one world economy. and We don't uh, split the uh, economy into, into two or more parts. I think that would hurt everybody. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you again, Jane san. Well, maybe Japan can show to the world that some best practice in many, many mm -hmm. issues uh -huh. where we are moving toward the aging demography, how to cope with yeah. that. And we are fighting against COVID-19. How can we conquer that, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in this regard, of course, I'd like to raise one more question. This is a global problem at the same time related to the domestic reform. The problem of Hong Kong. Well, from the viewpoint of human rights, from the viewpoint of the rule of the law, uh, we, we find a lot of problems in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong had been uh, playing, acting as a very important financial center in Asia. However, now uh, many uh, financiers are escaping from uh, Hong Kong, much money, much funding is esca escaping from money. Where, which country should accept that? At this moment, Singapore. Singapore. Uh, at the same time, Tokyo can play a very important role uh, to be a uh, uh, financial center, international financial center. Of course, this is uh, our merit. This is our you know, merit to the Japanese economy. At the same time, this will contribute a lot to the stability and development of the global financial market. However, we have some strong regulations here. So this could be another important case uh, for, for how can we contribute to the global economy. Well, the further headache is uh, the tax rate is very high in Japan compared with the Singapore. This is a little bit different uh, issue uh, from your job, maybe. This is the Ministry of Finance job. But at the same time, a lot of regulations, uh, visa issues, and uh, yeah, English education, the medical doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, how many doctors uh, treat a patient in English in this country, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what do you think of this? This must be a very interesting topic. And the Prime Minister also mentioned to create the International Financial Center in Japan, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, do you have any plan uh, to, to contribute to this uh, domestic reform? Mm -hmm. Well, this uh, Hong Kong issue is, uh, uh, I guess it's going to be a big issue. Who gets uh, all, the, all the business Hong Kong enjoys right now? Uh, right now, the LDP has uh, sort of a task team uh, about uh, financial center. So uh, I'm not taking the ownership of this issue for the financial center and others. But there, uh, more than that, uh, Hong Kong is the sort of a uh, center point for uh, our business in Asia. Uh, London, New York, and Hong Kong, I think, will be the three major uh, art market. Um, right now, we are working with finance ministry to get those art market moving to Japan. Uh, I think the finance ministry is very cooperative of deregulating uh, this issue. So I think we can have a sort of a uh, complete plan uh, to offer to uh, those business uh, very uh, soon. Mm -hmm. So that's just a part of it. I think the major thing is how we move the uh, fund of the financial institution out of Hong Kong to uh, Tokyo or Osaka or wherever in Japan. Uh, I'm waiting for the proposal coming out of the party and uh, if it requires some kind of deregulation then my uh, task uh, should start from there. Well, thank you very much. Uh, together with the ruling party uh, policy committee, uh, you're supposed to work uh, towards uh, creating the international financial market in Tokyo, uh, not, not only in Tokyo, but also. Some people are insisting Osaka is good, and some uh, people, maybe mm -hmm. financial minister is interested in Fukuoka, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is also politics, maybe. Uh, but anyway, uh, Kay, uh, so far we have been discussing so many important issues. Well, maybe, Japan, as I mentioned, has been enjoying the uh, liberal world order. And, uh, but this, the rule maker was the United States. But the United States is changing a lot, as you hear from uh, Jane Sang. Uh, under such circumstances, Japan's role is becoming very important. Of course, Japan cannot be a rule maker. However, uh, 
we should act as a rule shaper, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. uh, very finally, uh, Kono-san, could you mention the, a little bit the, the overall uh, diplomacy, international diplomacy of Suga mm -hmm. administration? Some people are criticizing Prime Minister Suga does not have an experience of foreign minister. He does not have an uh, experience of trade negotiator. However, I think he had been working uh, for more than seven years as the chief cabinet secretary, and chief cabinet secretary is always in the center of policy discussion. Mm -hmm. In that sense, I really expect a very uh, safe and steady uh, diplomacy. I really appreciate your uh, views, your comments on the, the total uh, uh, picture of the Japanese uh, diplomacy. Well, when I was a foreign minister, when I was defense minister, I briefed the chief cabinet secretary uh, as often as my brief to the prime minister. So he knows the global uh, issue uh, quite well. I mean, he's member of the National Security Council and he participated all the uh, defense discussion there as well. Only difference between Prime Minister Abe and the Prime Minister Suga is I'm not sure Suga-san plays golf or not. So I don't <laughs> think he could do uh, the golf diplomacy with President Trump as well as Prime Minister Abe. Uh, he will probably have to find the other way to connect to the President Trump. But uh, I think that's the only uh, difference between the previous prime minister. What an excellent answer. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, uh, he's, of course, eligible for the next prime minister, as you find. So, OK, now the floor is opened uh, to your comment and the questions. I think this is a, uh, this is a hybrid. So what, am I supposed to sign someone? Okay, you raise hand first, please. Please identify yourself, uh, name and the belongings, and uh, please uh, give a brief question. Yes, yes. Uh, so this is Taro Shimada from uh, Toshiba. Um, so one quest to the... Uh, can you hear? Can you hear? Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, this is Taro Shimada from Toshiba. Uh, I'd like to make uh, one request to the... Um, uh, 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 the, uh, the, the things that you're talking about, I'm very happy about that, uh, uh, get rid of the Hanko and all that. But this is just that uh, we kind of, uh, kind of uh, catching up with the, uh, the people who is doing the best practice in the world. So I'd like to make a request to that, uh, going to the beyond uh, the other countries. And uh, for example, data free flow and trust and so forth. This we should not forget. Okay, uh, I'd like to accept uh, two uh, uh, or three more questions. Uh, go ahead, please, and Frank, please. Mr. Kono, thank you very much. My name is Yamada from McKinsey. As you go through um, the huge reform in the government in Japan and also the digital transformation, what are the biggest risks that you see in terms of cybersecurity and data security, and how are you going to approach that together with Hirai san? in order to approach these risks. I'd love to hear your perspective. Thank you. Jorge Calvo, deputy dean of Lobby's uh, Business School. What is your vision about the uh, Japan Smart Society plan? And if it's going to be any change because of COVID-19? Mm -hmm. uh, Japan uh, Smart Society. Okay, well, c the first question is, uh, okay, we are catching up with the uh, global standard. Beyond that, what kind of role is expected? The second question is the cyber security. Is this correct? Cyber security. And, and the third one is uh, how can we realize the smart society? Okay. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I'm dividing our responsibility with uh, Hirai-san and uh, anything to do with digital, uh, I think he's supposed to take care of it. Uh, I know the data security is quite important to uh, promote uh, digital transformation. And uh, I'm sort of focusing on the real regulation, uh, meaning uh, I go first and then sort of uh, open up the way and uh, he will follow. Uh, 
through that. So I have to move faster so he can, <coughs> he can move. If I go slow, then he has to wait for deregulation. So I'm not really uh, worried about the digital security and those digital related issue that he has to take care of it. My job is to move faster to deregulate uh, in many ways. So I uh, hope he, uh, we will bring Hiraisan in next year so you can ask him direct questions. And uh, yes, uh, uh, smart society is going to be very important and I think we need to uh, move things uh, online and uh, make uh, life more convenient. Uh, in order to do that, I think we need to deregulate a lot of issues so that we can do things a uh, different way. A lot of regulation uh, we have is uh, often uh, started out before the World War II and we still continue the same regulation and that's definitely uh, out of the time. So we are identifying those and uh, try to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, one, one thing, Kono-san, Kono -san. well, uh, regarding the first question, though, what can we go, uh, you know, more than, for example, the <coughs> United States, et cetera, well, <coughs> data, data, data problem, data. For example, the Google tried to establish a smart city in the Toronto, in Canada, however, they were not successful because of the data privacy problem from the, the, uh, from the people, a lot of objection and concern. So how can we establish the data free flow with trust? This must be uh, the challenging point of Japan. Do you have any comments on that? Well, we have uh, enough domestic data issues. Each municipality have separate rules for uh, how to handle data and uh, that are often prohibit uh, even local government using those data or if we wanted to use the health data to process to see where, how we can cut uh, medical costs, we're not uh, able to use those data. So we are trying to come up with some way to modify the municipal uh, data protection rules and that's where we start from mm -hmm. here. And then uh, definitely we need to uh, sort of uh, create uh, similar uh, rules with uh, at least US, Europe, India, mm -hmm. Australia, Canada. Uh, hopefully China could come along. It would be a lot easier. I mean the population and size of data matters so uh, we definitely would like to uh, create the uh, sort of same uh, data rule across the countries. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for responding to the, the very uh, complicated issue. Okay, I'd like to accept uh, two oh, more questions. Oh, wait. Okay, one, three, three questions we'll accept, okay. Tatsuya uh, Terazawa speaking. Um, I strongly support the need to get rid of hankos but uh, it seems that your focus is more on the procedures. Uh, what about the substantial aspect of regulation, such as gambangse, bedrock, bed, gambangse, uh, bedrock regulation, the substantial side of regulation, how are you going to deal with th those aspects, including gambangse? Could you raise some good example of bedrock regulation? Um, one example is uh, the labor-related regulation. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for the very exciting uh, uh, speech. Uh, my name is Takuya uh, from uh, Rakuten Group. Um, when pushing for you know regular uh, reform, I'm curious, you know, what's the guiding principle or KPI you pr uh, you use to prioritize your you know, regular reform? For example, you know GDP of a country or sustainability of the world or you know let's say well-being of the country. So. Okay, thank you very much. Go ahead. Hi, thank you very much for the speech. Um, my name is Catherine O'Hara. I'm with the GHIT Fund. I'm the CEO of the GHIT Fund, the Global Health Innovative Technology Fund. Actually, the Japanese government funds us 50%. So thank you very much. 
Um, so my question is more a bit philosophical, I guess. So you mentioned our role uh, in the world is somewhat of a bridge. Konosana, I think you mentioned that. So what does that mean, though? What is Japan's strength as a country? What is Japan a leader of? Is it technology? Is it digital? Is it health? Is it, you know, what area is really Japan good at? And what can we show as examples, if you would, to the world and help, um, you know, be that bridge, a better bridge, if you would? Because I think the more you have a leadership skill or what, you know, something that you're good at, a differentiator from the world, right, the better or more effective you can be. So I'm just curious your opinion as to what that differentiator is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for raising uh, questions of uh, bedrock regulation like uh, labor market and the KPI and uh, well, some philosophical questions, the strengths of Japan. Uh, please. Yes, we are also <laughs> tackling the bedrock uh, regulation. Uh, we're just not making much announcement on it, but uh, we are already start talking to other agencies on these issues. That, that will take some time. So we are trying to uh, do deregulation, which we can do uh, much faster, but uh, the others are following. Uh, KPI, we're not quite sure that yet. Uh, we will uh, come up with probably later on, but uh, at this moment, not much. Uh, what's the strengths of Japan? Yes, that's a very good question. And uh, we used to be able to say, well, we have uh, very advanced technology and all those things, but are, uh, are we right now? Uh, so, um, well, we have. Uh, fairly good education system, fairly advanced uh, technology. We have fairly good whatever. Um, I think w what, do we, what do we need to do is uh, we need to integrate what we have and show that to the people. We have a, sort of a successful, uh, we have a couple of success story after the major restoration, we modernized uh, such a way, or after the World War II, we uh, recover such a, such a way and all those things. So we are hoping that we can uh, do the uh, digital transformation uh, just like we have been successful in the past. So what are, we, what are we trying to do is, we are not sort of talking from above. We are sort of talking as a peer to the other countries. We're not a uh, P5. We're not a member of the Security Council of the United Nations. We don't have nuclear weapons. We are just like you. But uh, so we can, we can work together. Uh, I think that's what we are going to do. We are a little different from those P5 country or, you know, things like that. Well, thank you very much, Konsan. Uh, uh, one another strength for Japan is uh, now we have an excellent minister like him, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your cooperation. And thank you for waiting, Jane san uh, Could you give uh, us uh, uh, the final comment? Oh, that time is quite limited. One or two minutes of uh, final comment, Jane san based upon this uh, Q and A session. Please, Jane san well, I was very interested in the question about uh, what is Japan's future role, and I think the answer was good. I think that um, for a variety of reasons, Japan has a very big opportunity uh, now in the world uh, because it, of where it is situated, because it wants to have a very good relationship with the U.S., and uh, Abe-san uh, made a good job of uh, forging the relationship with President Trump. Uh, and because it is uh, a sophisticated society that, that, that uh, understands technology, uh, understands uh, the, the, that, that the, the liberal world order is changing, but that doesn't mean that democracy is over. Japan has a vibrant democracy. So I would see, uh, or I would hope, that the U.S. will uh, survive its election, <laughs> somebody will win, and we will have the orderly transition of power, and that person, and uh, 
uh, Suga-san or Kono-san or whomever uh, will be very close uh, allies. And uh, that uh, I think that uh, Japan's future uh, is very strong, despite the, the uh, uh, economic uh, picture for the moment, and that it is a time for optimism in Japan. And again, I'm very happy to be uh, part of this conference. Uh, Yoshi is my very good friend. And uh, congratulations to all of you on the 10th anniversary. Thank you very much, Jensen, for a very encouraging message. Yoshi, uh, for your information, the uh, first name of uh, our Prime Minister is also Yoshi. Okay? Okay. And very finally, Kono-san, I'd like to hear a very decisive uh, uh, mindset, a decisive uh, voice toward the reform. Please. Thank you. Um, well, what I will tell my people is it's okay to make mistakes. Uh, there's a sort of a myth that the bureaucracy cannot make mistakes. Well, uh, if we make too many of them, it will be very inconvenient to the people, and that's probably not tolerable. But uh, it's okay to make mistakes sometimes, and uh, if that happens, we just have to change the course, and all the blame's on me. So I, th I think rather than trying to be 100% uh, perfect and slow down, I think what we need right now is speed up the process, and if we made mistake, well, we just apologize and change the course. That is inconvenient to the society, I understand, but I think overall, it'll be good for entire Japan to move faster and minor mistakes acceptable so people can challenge things you know you just have to do it and if it doesn't work then try the other way uh, I think sometimes the government need to do that too so we would like to pick up the speed thank you okay, thank you Thank you very, very much for your cooperation. And very finally, please give a big hand to, to panelists. Thank you very much. Globus.